Kurt Steger, a professor of biology at Paul Smith College, enjoys involving students in his research. And the rubber band goes on. His latest project is combing the Adirondack Mountains for evidence of Native American activities since the end of the last ice age. Conventional wisdom asserts that Native Americans didn't inhabit the Adirondacks, or at least not to a high degree. The soil was too rocky, the climate too cold. But conventional wisdom may be wrong. Okay, lower away. Recent finds by Steger and his students tell a different story. Looks like you got mud. Okay, let's bring it in so the ball is right here. Yep, there you go. Blah. Let's put it on the toolbox. There you go. All right, now the next thing is let's take those leg weights off. And yeah, we're getting mud on us. That's a good sign. There you go. Yep. Excellent. So the whole history of Paul Smith's hotel and the college would be in this tube of mud right now. So what we'd want to see is maybe at the very bottom, there might be some corn pollen if people were growing it here, or maybe even charcoal if they were burning the forest to make a clearing or camping here a lot. So it looks like we got what we wanted. So the next thing is now we've got to capture the mud so it doesn't pop out the bottom. If you can hold on to that ball and lift this up, we'll get the corks out of the box here. This is where we win or lose the whole project. There you go. So here's where we got to coordinate. This has to go into the bottom before the mud falls out and it'll fall out as soon as you pull that ball away from the bottom of it. We're gonna go one, two, three, and when I say the word three, Tim is gonna pull that ball away from the bottom towards himself, and you're gonna shove that in and cork the whole thing and push it right in to the bottom of the pipe. Ready? Yeah. One, two, three. <laughs> there you go. Yes, push it right in there. Water should come out the top. Perfect. So um, we're gonna snap this off. I'll hold the pipe if you pull the core up and it should come away from the pipe. There you go. There you go. Ta-da! First mud! So this is what Paul Smith is known for. It's about the experience and in this case we're experiencing real research looking into the deep history of this beautiful place. So while other students are talking nerdy, we're getting dirty. <laughs> John Fadden of the Six Nations Indian Museum in nearby Anchayota explains to visitors that 12,000 years before Columbus, people established a presence in the Adirondack Mountains, one that continues to this day. There's an old wives' tale that says that the Indians never lived here. You know, it's like they avoided this place like it was taboo for some unknown reason. And, they, and of course, I believe that it's, that's ridiculous. Just like today, you have to prepare for the winter, for what's coming. They had working knowledge of this environment that was far superior to what we have today. And the flora and the fauna was a lot different. There's like about 70 different plants that grow naturally that can help sustain you. They used to have mountain lions here, they used to have wolves and wolverines, and they ate things that humans eat. And so there was plenty of protein walking around in these woods, not to mention the fish. There's rivers nearby that are called Salmon River, and they were called that for a reason. There used to be Atlantic salmon that would come up to St. Lawrence and then up into these rivers for spawning. So the people back then just as simply prepared for the winter, they would survive, and I'm sure that they did. And they did, because here I am. Along the drainage of the Racket River, near the village of Tupper Lake, archeologist Tim Messner and SUNY Potsdam students have been making important finds. Each one supports the idea that Native Americans lived in the Adirondack Mountains for a very long time. We spent four weeks at this location, four challenging weeks, meaning every morning you had to paddle in order to get out here. There's bugs, there's rain, there's the threat of thunder and lightning, and things could go wrong. Things could go wrong real quick, 
And the students were great. The students made this experience a successful one. Step one is simply to scour the area, to look for artifacts and to look for where clustering of artifacts occurred. We use that information to kind of guide where we're gonna invest more time. You slowly peel off the layers of earth and you do it in 10 centimeter increments so you can control where things come from. The idea is that archeology span is a destructive process, but we work to minimize the destruction, meaning everything is mapped, everything is drawn, it's photographed, it's recorded, so that way people can reconstruct the site back in the lab. The students found a fragment of a projectile point. So this is the base. It would have come to a tip, much like my fingers are outlining. The style of the point seems to suggest a period of time known as the Archaic Era. It dates to about five to 7,000 years ago. This is a chalcedony, it's a, a chert-like material. To my knowledge, the chert is not locally available. The material tells us something about the connections, where people have been, who they're talking to, who they're interacting with, in procuring the raw material to make their stone tools. The Adirondacks is part of the story, this idea that people have been coming to the mountains and utilizing the resources, the plants, the animals, but also the mountains themselves for a long, long time. And I think what the archaeology is doing is it's helping to tell this story, a story that native peoples themselves have been telling for a long time, that yes, we've been here, yes, this land is important to us, but it's largely been ignored by most. Back in a lab at Paul Smith's college, Kurt Steger and his students examine cores taken from the bottom of Lower St. Regis Lake. The samples may or may not contain traces of charcoal and corn pollen left behind by Native Americans who once lived along the shore. Basically, we'll put it in like this. There's a cork in the bottom. So as we push the pipe down, the mud's now coming out the top. And you go down a centimeter by putting this spacer in there, and it lets it drop, but this stops it, so it only goes a centimeter. So, yeah. Now a centimeter popped off the top, so you go whoosh, put it in the bag. We're gonna need that much space. Yeah, we may need it. So it's gonna be about like that. Here's always the part I'm afraid I'm gonna lose everything. There it is. Okay. If you have your arm angled like this and the water starts coming out, guess where it goes? Right down to right down your, your <laughs> armpit. Okay. All right. You want to try it? I can try. So that goes on. We'll use a glass slide, microscope slide, to scrape it off as it comes. So that's probably two or three years worth of mud there, and then it gets more and more as you go down. Great. That's the beginning of your career at Paul Smith's right in there. When you took wow. intro bio, the plankton toe, the plankton's in there. <laughs> what we're doing here is capturing the softest, most recent mud, which is good to have because we can compare it to the known history here. For Kurt Steger, Tim Messner, and their students, the work continues. Sifting through 12 or 13,000 years of sediment and soil is no small chore. And the six million acre Adirondack Park is a big place in which to go sleuthing. Still, important finds may turn up in plain view, including right on the campus of Paul Smith's College. Right near where we're sitting, somebody left a projectile point, maybe an arrow, maybe a small spear or a dart. Judging from the stem on here, um, it could be a few centuries old or thousands of years old. We know the stone's not from here. This would have had to have been brought in from somewhere else because this kind of stone isn't up here in the Adirondack uplands. John Lothrop is an expert in ancient artifacts at the State Museum in Albany, and he looked at this and said, well, this groove right here, the thinning of the artifact at the base, the overall shape, the kind of stone, and also being found in high ground like this means it could be really, really old. One of the oldest artifacts ever found in the Adirondacks, maybe as old as 13,000 years. So in other words, people have probably been here longer than the trees. People are more native to the Adirondacks than the forest.
when you read a history book, it's about things that happened in the past. This is the actual material that was there in the past. So these are the actual algae, the actual pollen from the plants and stuff. Uh, the sediment that washed off on a rainy day, some of the goose poo. And uh, if they were there, you know, eating in their garden or something like that, it's the actual remains of the past are still in here. So it's like a time capsule. The great thing about this is it shows that in the Adirondacks, our environment shapes who we are and how we live. But of course, nowadays, it's the other way around as well. We're changing the world and we can see the signs of pollution. But if we go farther back in time, the Native Americans who lived here for thousands of years had minimal impacts on the land. So probably the most interesting story to come out of this older stuff is uh, what were the environmental changes going on when the Native folks were living here and what did they have to deal with? So while we were out there taking our core, what we were hoping to do was collect plankton that had fallen to the bottom into the layers of mud. But the plankton's living in the lake now too. So uh, I'd like to collect some of the modern stuff as well. And the kinds of things we're finding in here now, um, we may well find also going back into the past for centuries, unless the lake has changed a lot since those early times when the original inhabitants were here. Yeah, here you go. Oh yeah, you got stuff. <laughs> I'll put it in here and we'll take a look. Okay. Under the microscope, I'll take a little sample of this. We'll look under, see what kinds of algae, they're called diatoms. And there are many species. They look like beautiful little snowflakes. And different diatoms tell you different things about the lake. And so um, on the core sediments, we'll find diatoms that lived a long time ago and fell to the bottom. We talk about where you and I live, we can write that address on an envelope, and we do. And we send those letters off and they arrive at your house. But for the greatest portion of human history, people lived as hunters and gatherers. And they didn't live anywhere year round. You moved. You moved to follow animal migrations. You moved depending upon the seasons and resource availability. So did people live here? Yes, they lived here. They lived throughout the Adirondacks. You talk about where people lived, they lived, you know, they called a watershed home. They called the mountains home. So yes, you know, they certainly did live here. Well, it started with my dad as in, and sometimes I'll tell people that he more or less dragged the rest of us along because he was very strong about it, very passionate and dedicated. And he was born in uh, 1910. Just 20 years before that was 1890. And that's when they slaughtered those Lakota people in South Dakota. Uh, it's called a Wounded Knee Massacre. And so the attitude uh, toward that idea of slaughtering Indians wasn't that long before my father was born. And some of that kind of mentality was still around here when he came into uh, consciousness. In our museum, we have a dugout canoe that's about 250 years old that was found in Lake Placid. And how that was found was by accident. There was some scuba divers who were salvaging sunken logs. You can get them out and mill them and sell them for lumber. In the process of doing that, they came across this dugout canoe and got it out and then uh, somehow they heard about our museum and they at some point came here and offered to sell it. And I think my dad bought it for $100 back then. And this was in the late 50s. I knew that I wanted to be up here somewhere um, studying biology, but I came to Paul Smith because of the location and because of the teachers. It's a great program, especially for environmental majors. Um, you get to be outside every day, doing what you love, studying what you love. It's, it's a lifestyle. When I first came here, it was my first experience going in the canoe, kayaks or whatnot. I'm used to just community pools, but going out with a canoe with friends and seeing the beautiful environment, uh, the wildlife, and just finding new things is always awesome. I think the cool thing about environmental science here is the labs because I know some people that are going to other colleges and they don't get to go outside for their labs. It's all conceptual. 
and we have the Vic, we have all of the resources here on campus and you really get to go out and see what you're learning about in lecture. Some of the things that I've noticed at this school in particular is you have a dedicated staff of not only teachers but professionals that are wanting you to go out and do this type of things. So it's, it's very interesting and it's extraordinary to go out in the boat and get mud all over your pants and wet and you know, but when you get back into the lab and you start looking at the results and what you're actually doing, it's a little bit different than just reading it from text inside of a book. Mm -hmm.